1978, Fran Bay, John Bay, my wife Barbara, and myself, and a few more people, we did a history of Casadera in 1978. Unfortunately, Fran and John Bay have passed away. And I'd like to dedicate a few moments of silence to Fran and John. I don't know how many of you people know that we actually had a factory in Casadera. It ran from 1916 uh, to 1926. A fellow by the name of Porter Barnes concocted what he called powerine. Cars started coming out about 1916 in abundance. He made a pill about the size of a quarter. It was pink in color and about a quarter of an inch thick, and it smelled like mothballs. Fifty in a container like this, fifty containers in a carton. He sold them for one dollar. He, he shipped it all over to North Dakota, South Dakota, Colorado, and everybody came back telling him how good it was. One man wrote back and said, before I use Parine, he said, I, my wife used to have to push me and my car through the snow. Since I put 10 pellets of this in, we both ride through the snow. <laughs> also, if you look real close, it's good for arthritis, upset stomach, and rattlesnake bite. <laughs> Our first speaker, speaker is Jim. Barry, a fourth generation native of Casadera and a son of our local mill owner, Lorne Barry. At this time, I'd like to present Jim Barry. Our story tonight, believe it or not, starts 12,000 years ago. <laughs> that story starts with the ancestors of the Kashaya Indians, the Yuki Indians, who came across the ice bridge from Siberia and gradually worked their way down the coast to uh, find a, a bountiful and plentiful land where they could get along on uh, perhaps 10 hours of work a week. The Indians called this place, and we believe this is a very likely location of the village Kaba Batelli, the first name for Casadero. And the Kashaya meaning for that is Big Rock. I want to, I want to show you the last, the last remnants of the evidence of uh, that village. To the left, there is a large shadow, and next to that, just, just to the right of that are some small holes, look, what appear to be small holes. Those are bedrock mortars which were used to grind acorns and which were often had scribings on them. So I want to take you on a journey because Casadero, that's one of the things that Casadero is well known for is the huge boulders. Um, the Indians, of course, made good use of them. 
and uh, this another reason for the the village being here was that uh, there was a, an abundant supply of wheat acorns which is their staple diet and also uh, deer uh, multiplied or uh, thrived on that diet and there was uh, fish nearby and willows for baskets so this was a, a prime spot for an Indian village here's a here's a blow up uh, close up of the that same boulder taken by the postmaster at that time Ben Lee that rock was blown with dynamite uh, in the early 1930s to make way for widening the road as the automobile took over from the railroad about a half mile west is a rock called a fertility rock it's on Ward Creek it the purpose of this rock was it was primarily a, a feminine rock it was a rock that a woman a Kashaya Indian woman would go to in order to improve her chances of conceiving she would have an elaborate ritual would would pound powder in those little cupules and actually ingest powder and with this ritual it was supposedly uh, she was supposedly able to improve her chances of having a child two more miles to the west is another rock called petroglyph basically Indian scribings to date Sonoma State and other uh, scientists have not been able to figure out the meaning of these scribings whether they were personal or whether they were understood by the tribe at large the the next rock farther west toward the coast is a, a bedrock mortar which was also used to grind acorns and it was in the middle of, of uh, oak woodland fields and huge oaks nearby springs and those are the places that you might find uh, Indian uh, remains artifacts and such and such Here's, the call, here's a picture of the Caldwell collection showing the, the Indian uh, arrowhead scrapers and all kinds of Indian tools uh, made out of obsidian. Uh, obsidian is not native to this area, so we know it came from somewhere else. Also, there is, uh, there's even in that picture uh, attempts to make uh, arrowheads out of glass in the early days of the white man. To the upper right is a hammer stone or pestle. To the upper left, is a mortar and the two were used together to uh, grind things seeds and acorns to make meal when uh, the Indian uh, braves didn't come home with the buck here here is an, a map sh here's a map showing the Kashaya Indian range Pacific Ocean to the left and this is basically Sonoma County here's the southern range near Salmon Creek where the timber runs out uh, here's the Russian River, this line right here. Of course, just to the north of that would be Kaba Batelli. Notice that if you consider the range of that, Kaba Batelli is about in the center of that, of that range, so it could very well have been uh, a meeting place uh, for the powwows for the entire southeast Pomo or Kashaya tribe. Here's the Pomo Indian using the first uh, the the, uh, uh, the example of a, of a bracing bit uh, which was used by the Kashayas to drill holes in, in shells. The shells were their money or currency which they used to, uh, to ex for exchange and uh, basically you, they wore their bank account, account around their neck. Here's an example of fizzy, fi finished product. There, there's, there's your bank account. No interest but uh, it's there where you know it is. Here is Ezzie Parrish, uh, a Pomo Indian woman who's making a brush shelter to store acorns from the uh, fall acorn harvest. Uh, they had to share a lot of these with, uh, with the animals, but hopefully there'd be enough to get through the winter. Here's a first example of the Pomo basket tree. They use baskets to, uh, to pound. And in the pestle there, you can see you're using the hammerstone used to grind up uh, meal. And they were the uh, Pomo Indians, or the Kashaya Pomos, were famous all over the world for, for uh, their baskets. And there's baskets such as this in museums uh, in major cities all over the world. 
or a few could match them for their basketry. They could make a basket out of, for most anything, out of most anything. Here's a fish trap basket made out of willow boughs. The willow boughs could easily be found right here along uh, Cabo Batelli, the banks of Austin Creek. There's a, another basket made for the papoose so that he was never uh, far away from mother. And here's a festive time with the, uh, with the Braves doing their, their, their festive dance. Uh, this is actually a current group, but this is a lot like it might have been uh, in the early 1800s when the Russians first, uh, first met the Kashayas. Now picture a whole, uh, a whole group of these red, redwood bark structures uh, in the flat there uh, in the central Casadero, and uh, that may very well have been how it was. There's a roundhouse where they'd get together in their uh, meetings, uh, maybe with other tribes as well. Most of the children seen here are Kashaya Pomo from Kid Creek School Number 1. These children, the Santos and Arnolds, occupied the last Kashaya encampment located in the Casadero area near the site of Cas Continental Telephone. Grace Straff Gilbert is located third from the left in the front row. Grace Gilbert is my wife Joyce's mother. Now the reason I showed this in this way is, uh, is this is an early settler's cabin in contrast to, uh, to the Indian uh, redwood shelters. The, this, this is one of four vertical log cabins still existing and three of them are being lived in that are um, about one mile within my, one mile west of Elam Grove on St. Elmo Creek. Here's the inside of what it looks like. Uh, and uh, to the left is a native stone fireplace. And speaking of native stone fireplace, Here's the George and Mopsy Christopher Place, famous uh, early 1900 settlers. Uh, this is a native stone fireplace which uh, is in the house that Joe and Judy Marchia live right now. And here's a great example of a house entirely made with split, split products before the uh, sawmills came into the area. Uh, there's, as far as we can tell, there's not one single sawn uh, piece of lumber in that house. Notice how they've covered the, the fireplace with shakes. To the left is the guy I'm trying to portray tonight, Tom Trosper. Uh, he, this is him much later uh, when he's much older, but he was in his 30s when he came into uh, Casadero country. He was a professional hunter and a, a professional guide. and. Uh, Casadero attracted even because uh, being land of the deer, it was, it was one of the most uh, populated areas for deer, which is great for a professional hunter. And that's probably the main reason why he stayed here and uh, took up his homestead in, 19, or in 1862. But one day when he was first coming into this area, before he had married Cornelia McGuire, uh, who we can thank for the, the, uh, the Cornelia, Prosper Diary, which tells us a lot about what life was like then. Uh, before he married her, one day he was going through the, the woods back to his cabin and he was ambushed by five Indians, local Indians. And being a wild man and being a famous mountain man who had come across the West with a lot of famous mountain men, he knew how to take care of himself. And uh, he, he, by the way, he had, he had gone through, uh, try come over, come West to uh, participate in the California Gold Rush and that didn't work out for him, so I became a hunter. Well, these Indians attacked him, and he killed three, and the other two ran away. But he suffered for months from uh, his wounds. He had 27 uh, major wounds on his body, and his partner helped nurse him back to health. Here's a uh, Trosper family portrait, probably at their, uh, their homestead on Bear Pen Creek. And here's a friend and uh, actually a relative by marriage of the Trospers. Um, his sister married uh, Francis Drake Trosper, who you'll hear a lot about later. Uh, John Quincy Adams was uh, a noted woodsman of his time, but was especially noted for playing the fiddle at Trosper Barn dances. He was a relative of President John Quincy Adams. And here's a, another 1860s settler, uh, 
are two settlers, si Silas and Sarah Ingram, who came uh, also in the 1860s. And Silas was instrumental in not only getting, in, in basically in, in improving transportation to Casadero. Uh, Casadero was basically uh, landlocked in the wintertime until he paid the astronomical sum of $8,000 to have a road built uh, across the cliffs uh, to Guerneville. And also, he was instrumental in getting the railroad uh, to run its spur, its narrow gauge spur, into Casadero in 1886. Here's a uh, Ingram family portrait with uh, Silas on the left with his uh, stogie there. Here's an example. Here's this shows. This is a great shot of Ingram, Ingram's resort. Uh, not long before he sold to uh, George Montgomery. Uh, this, this is the second Ingram's Resort. The first one burned down uh, on, on a location on Bay Road uh, at the site of where Ken and Harriet Parmeter lived. And there's the man that purchased the, the hotel. My great-grandfather, George Simpson Montgomery. This shows him on a trip to Japan with Mount Fuji in the background. I guess it's a portrait in the background, but uh, was on the Jap Japanese trip. He went there to recover his health. He'd had he'd been a heavy drinker and quite a party man, and uh, he went over there to recover his health. And instead, he uh, came back a Christian. <laughs> so, and perhaps he uh, recovered his health as well. But George. That, that very, that conversion changed Casadero history because uh, he, he grew to hate alcohol so much that he put a covenant on all the property sold here in Casadero that no alcohol could be sold. Therefore, uh, the neighbors who wanted to wet their whistle had to go off property to, uh, to do so. And there was, so there was a bar within inches of the boundary uh, to, on into the 19th century. And here's the, here's it how the hotel looked as he bought it from Silas Ingram. Notice there's a, it's a lot more overgrown, but basically the same place. And he uh, ran it at just like that for about 10 years. Here's the, uh, another branch of the hotel right across the road, uh, un unknown date. Now one of the, one of the best things that the Mo Montgomery's uh, like to do, or the, most, the favorite things they like to do, uh, in Casadero was admire the Redwoods, but most of all, they enjoyed their camp meetings. Uh, they were uh, revival meetings, and uh, they had people from all over the world speaking there. In the center is George Montgomery in his middle 50s. On his right is my great-grandmother, Carrie, and on the left is my grandmother, Faith. Here's another well-known local family, three generations. The fellow to the left, the oldest guy, is John Parmeter, who came here in the 1880s as an official of the railroad, and his family never left. His son is William Wade Parmeter, and the baby he's holding is Willard Kern Parmeter. Now there are six generations of Parmeters living here, and as far as I can tell, <clears throat> According to Lynn Parmeter Anderson, there's about 83 Parmeters living between here and Duncan's Mills. <laughs> Here's another old timer that came in the 1880s, William Quigley. And he's, uh, he's admiring his uh, fantastic garden, garden there, and uh, really proud of it, obviously. Quigley was, uh, was the first first deputy sheriff in this area. And there are now about six generations of turdies descended from him living here in Casadero. Another early resident that came in the 1880s, that bought here in the 1880s, was uh, Boss Meeker. He's second from the right in the back. You can see his profile. Uh, they own property on, the east, on East Austin and probably used the railroad to uh, haul the logs out uh, from that property. There's, there's a profile or a mug shot of them. Here's another interesting local 
old timer, Grace Gilbert's mother, Flora Strath Rubley. She's wearing a coat made of pole mountain pole cats. <laughs> well, in case you don't know what a pole cat is, those are skunks. These, these skunks are trapped right here in Casadero by Flora herself. And yep, she, made, she kept, trapped them herself. Here's an example of a four horse team with the wagon to the right, showing an example of how commerce what, took place in, in Casadero in those days. Uh, just about everything was hauled around on a wagon or on horseback uh, in the early 1900s and before. The classic cabin to the left. There's William King, our only, the only 5th District Supervisor that Casadero has produced. Uh, he was a supervisor about 1910, and Kingridge Road is named after him, and also he had King's Resort. Now this is, the, this is the guy who started Roman's Resort. I don't know his first name, his name's Roman, of uh, Finn. There was a whole wave, another wave of early, uh, residents, including Italian immigrants that came in the early 1900s, including this guy, McBain's and Mohart's and Mackey's and many others, uh, also Murray's, uh, who have about four generations uh, have had the summer ho summer cabin across from uh, the turn the old railroad turntable. Uh, one of the most well known of those is uh, Frank Butch Snyder, the friendly butcher. Uh, he was cowpoke and butcher, and that's that's a great combination. And that just so happens to be the father of tonight's MC, and I'll give give you back to Bob. Pacific Coast Railroad. The North Shore NS usually stood for not sure the train was going to get there. <laughs> they had lots of problems. In 1904, it was bought out by the Northwestern Pacific Railroad. Here's an early picture of the building of the railroad uh, being constructed in the early days. Incidentally, the first railroad that came into the town of Casadero, where you are now, came in April of 1886. Oh, another picture of the crew laying the truck in the Casadero. <clears throat> Here's a picture of Casadero in the early 1800s. If you notice, that's an narrow gauge rail railroad, and that's the first store in Casadero, which was right along the railroad tracks. 
Here's a picture of an early day. There is a stagecoach that will head north to and go to a little town which is abandoned now called Sea View. Next was Plantation, Stewart's Point, and on up the coast. Notice the railroad car is backwards. The train came in, and I'll show you a little later, they had a turntable. The engine came back, came down to where the firehouse is, turned around and hooked onto the train. The only thing that went out to the right direction was the engine. Now, <clears throat> here's an early day of a stagecoach leaving Casadero. If you notice, they had a meat market in those days. Off to the left was the post office. If you notice on the back, they have all the baggage and everything covered up in case of rains and also to keep the wheels from throwing mud on the, the, the baggage. Now, do you recognize this man? This is Black Bart, that's right. Black Bart was quite, quite a legend. There's been many books written about Black Bart. In fact, there's just been one came out about a year and a half ago this gentleman wrote and asked me for some pictures of some stagecoaches, and he said he was going to write the real book in Black Bart. Well, there must be 20 or 30 of them, but no doubt this man was quite a, quite a, a robber. He robbed the, doing pretty good. That, he robbed the Wells Fargo stages 28 times. He, his uh, paraphernalia was a flour sack over his head, two holes so he could see through, packed a shotgun which was never loaded. At many of his robberies, he'd leave a note, and one of the most noted, or left a note and also poems, and one of his most noted poems uh, I will read to you now. I've labored hard and long for bread, for honor and for riches. But for on my corns, too long you've tread, you fine-haired sons of bitches. <laughs> there was a, the, the Wells Fargo detective was J.P. Hume. And he spent many years, in fact, Black Bart Pertner drove him nuts. On one of the last robberies that Black Bart pulled, he lost his handkerchief. And apparently, all the laundries in San Francisco put a mark on their handkerchief. He found this handkerchief, Hume did, and all the mark on the handkerchief was FX07. In San Francisco, there was 90 laundries. And Mr. Hume went to all those, and he was almost exhausted when he found the laundry that had this mark. He found out the man's name. His name was Fulton. He went there, he lived three, three, block, or three blocks from the laundry, and when he confronted him, he says, yes, I'm your man. He went to San Quentin in 1883 and got out in 1888. They caught him in November, and within two weeks, he was put in prison. A lot different today. Here's a picture of an early early uh, <clears throat> engine, if you notice in the back, this is what they call the wood burner, the wood's on the back end. And there's the crew on the train uh, that in the Casadero, next. Here's a good picture of the turntable. The engine came down there, uh, all the crew got out, and in fact, when we were kids, we used to help them turn the, the engine around. Once in a while, they'd give us a ride down, and they'd even let us shovel coal into the engine till the officials come up one day and that ended that insurance problems even in those days. Next. Here's a picture of the crew uh, south of Casadero, about one mile. I'll tell you a little more about that tree there. Next. Here's one of the early coaches that we rode, that you rode into San Francisco. The train would leave here around one o'clock and we were very lucky in Casadera because when you got on the train here, you got on the right-hand side because when you got down and left the town of Tamales, you went along the Tamales Bay, and if you were on the left-hand side, all you did was look at banks all the way. Here is what they call a work train. This is almost called a caboose. This is the work train. Every, 
every so often they'd bring a crew into Casadera and they would they cooked in this and they would sleep in one parts of it and they'd work on the railroad track when it needed major repairs. Here's another picture of a wood burner. If you notice on the, the far left, that's a picnic train. They picked people up in Sausalito and brought them up on an excursion and then, then took them back. This was in the early days. Next. Here's a picture, if you notice, the engines is a little more modern, just getting ready to leave Casadera. Here's a engine parked beside a large pile of ties. Now in those days, redwood ties were used very much by the railroad. You could put them in the ground, they would not rot, and they were shipped all over the United States to be used to put the rails on. That's quite a pile of posts. In fact, all the old timers made a, a major living out of making those posts. Would you believe, if you notice it's raining, these were the stockyards just below town in Casadero, almost opposite the store, just a little bit below. This is in July of 1923, and the creek is bank deep. Take a look at that, even in the stockyards. The, all the ranchers brought their livestock and put them in the stockyards. They were loaded up on, in, the box, in, the, in, the, uh, in the stock cars there and shipped down to San Francisco. Here's a picture of the station agent in front of the station. If you notice to your right, notice all the cream cans. Uh, Casadere in the early days had a lot of dairies here. They'd come here and put their cream on the train and was shipped to the creamies south of here. Here's a picture of the train coming to Casadere. We're almost sure this is crossing Kid Creek where you go up to Casanoma Lodge. Next. <clears throat> Here was kind of a bad day. This... <clears throat> As if I had to tell you. <laughs> Incidentally, this is south of the forestry down there. The train naturally ran off the tracks. Uh, from all the old history we can dig up, it took them two and a half days to get it back on the tracks. They had block and tackles. They didn't have the modern convenience we have now. Now, here is the Austin Creek tragedy. I don't know whether all of you have heard about this, but this is just at Elam Grove, just about a quarter, uh, half a mile south of Casadera. On January 14, 1894, the Saturday night to Monday train was parked here in Cal or was left uh, stayed in Casadera. They'd come in on Saturday and they'd stay over till Monday morning and leave early uh, to go to Sausalito. For some reason, during uh, on January 14, the crew decided to go to Duncan's Mills. No one really knows, but apparently it was a party, I imagine. It had been raining for two days. Austin Creek was bank deep. They got on the train, the postmaster, the station agent, and another civilian and the crew came to the Elam Grove Bridge. Still raining, Austin Creek bank deep. The conductor got out, walked across the bridge, and they don't know, he, they claimed he waved his lantern. They don't know whether he wanted them not to cross or to cross. However, they got to the middle of the bridge and engine number nine went in the brink. After two days, when the Austin Creek came down, the smokestack stuck out. They had a big investigation naturally. Seven people drowned. After 10 days, they found all the bodies except one. And they looked up and down the creek. Now here's the story that was told to me as a young person. It's in many of the old railroad books. Well, I'm going to tell it to you and you make your own conclusion. An old Indian or Spaniard lived here and said, I will find the body. What he did is he put a 
he lit a candle and put it on a shingle, put it in the creek where number nine went in the brink. He had two dogs by his side. The candle went down the creek, went down about a quarter mile, swirled around, the candle went out and the dogs barked. The old Spaniard said, look there. Sure enough, they found the body. Now you take it for what it's worth. <clears throat> here's, a, here's a picture of the newer trussel he built after the tragedy, south of Casadera by Elam Grove. Next. Here's the Hotel Elam Grove, south of town. If you notice, there's a platform. The railroad came up there, and people got right out of the cars right onto the platform. This is quite a high-class hotel. Next. Here's what they call the whistle trees. The reason they called these the whistle trees when the train came coming in the Casadera, coming north, when they got there, they blew the whistle, and the people at Elam Grove knew that the train was just about there. Also, if you notice, the little mark on the right-hand side, that was 82 miles to San Francisco. Next. Here's another picture going between the whistle trees. Next. Here's a big celebration of some kind, the whistle tree. If you notice, the old smokestack and the old engine there. Also, apparently this is leaving because if you notice, the train is going out backwards and the engine forward. Next. Here's a picture, another at the whistle tree, another celebration. Next. Here's a picture of two fellows at the whistle tree. If you notice, the far tree on the right, they couldn't get through between the trees, so they took and chopped the, chopped the side out of that redwood and they could get the engine through. Next. How do you like that name, Casadera? This was a ferry boat. When you got the Sausalito, you took it across and you went to the ferry building in San Francisco, and this could hold as much as 2,000 people. Next. Here's where he ended up on Market Street in San Francisco at the ferry building. As a small boy, I remember crossing the ferry and on one of my first trips. I couldn't believe what I saw there, especially a hick from the sticks. This was a trouble car. This was used by the station agent in Casadera here. If the telegraph line fell down and he couldn't get the, the messages and the telegrams through, when he got through it's his work, he'd get on this and would go to Duncan's Mills. And also, on rainy weather and the creek got high, he could go down and check the railroad to see if it was, the train could get into Casadera. I like that pretty lady. We also had another little railroad went up East Austin Creek. If you notice, it goes to Camp Roy and A. This was a 24-inch gauge railroad. It was, in 1914, a bunch of promoters sold stock in this thing, and apparently it was quite a promotion. They had several engines. They, it was magnesite. It ran about 12 miles up East Austin. They brought their ore down to the main line down here, dumped it in, in the Northwest Pacific Railroad, and shipped their ore down south. Also, now here, if you notice, before, you never saw any cars in a picture like that. A more modern locomotive, getting ready to leave Casadero. Incidentally, uh, I was just reading this afternoon, I think you could buy one of those cars in those days for about $350 to $450. Now you're lucky to get a spare tire for that. Next. Here's an engine getting ready to leave Casadero. If you notice, there's a second train back there on the left. There was many trains also. A more modern car. Also, if you notice the sign there, says Casadera. We have to thank the Moore family who have been coming here for years. When you leave here, if you look in the back end of the fire hall here, on your right-hand side in the back end, we have the old Casadera sign up there telling how many miles to San Francisco and the elevation of Casadera. This was, uh, the station was torn down by a man about 1940. He built a picnic table up in Ward Creek, and the Moors were up there, and he'd made a bench out of this, and they survived the sign, and they donated to the Casadera Fire Department community, and thanks to the Moore family. Next. Here's another picture. Later days, if you notice, the cars are more modern. Engine getting ready to leave Casadera, probably about uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. This was a sad day in Casadera. On July 31st, 1933, the last train left Casadera. 
a bunch of the town folks got together. There are some of the people are in this audience tonight that are in that picture there. We had a mock funeral and buried a miniature train. Next picture, please. Here, the, ho the whole town came. This is probably the whole Casadera community from far and wide in, in 1933. Came to see the, the last day of the train. Next. Here's a man on the left is Larry Varnarx. He ran the mail stage from Casadera North. And the other gentleman is John Udgeweather, who had a dairy on Fort Ross Road. Also, the wreath on the engines has gone forever. Next. There's the final thing. Number 23 died July 31st, 1933. That was a sad day for the people in Casadera. Good evening, everybody. In 1886, the first resort was built by Silas Ingram, located at the foot of Bay and Fort Ross Roads. The budding town was called Ingram's, a grocery and supply store across the bridge at the foot of Guerneville Grade constituted the town. In 1889, a San Francisco businessman named George Montgomery bought the town of Ingram and 13,000 acres. He renamed the town Casadero. The hotel burned down in the late 1890s, but there were many other buildings in connection with the hotel, so business continued. You notice now the sign reads Casadero. The far farthest known resort north of Casadero was the King Ranch, located five and a half miles north on King Ridge Road. The road was at, uh, the cost was eight to ten dollars a week, including meals, and we apologize for no picture. About three miles north of Casadero on King Ridge Road, Fred Ingram, son of Silas, and also the father of the early stagecoach driver, built a resort in 1905 known as Ingram's. Perched upon the hillside was the chateau a popular hotel for honeymooners. 
it was very secluded. <laughs> Tent pl uh, platforms dotted the opposite hillside. Many of these trees still stand today and are visible from the roadway. The cost to stay at Ingram's was 12 to $14 a week or 250 a day. There was a recreation hall built by Ingram called the Lodge. In the 1940s, it was known as Omens Resort. Many locals would stop there to wet their whistles, especially on a warm day, and their thick milkshakes were very popular. A mile south was Trosper's Lodge. Lodge. Dances and many other social affairs were given for entertainment of guests and friends alike. With the addition of these honeymoon suites and cottages, Trosper's Lodge could accommodate 75 guests. Cost was $19 a week, American plan. This picture shows the old wooden bridge leading to Trosper's from King Ridge Road. The bridge was later replaced and now leads to the Joe Turdy Ranchero the last butcher in town. One half mile from the town at the junction of Ward and Austin Creeks was Millerick's Resort. The main building called the Clubhouse, and it's still standing today, it was a saloon. There were many ta uh, tent platforms and a few rough cabins. There was a swimming hole in Ward Creek, which is a damn sight colder than the Austin according to many guests. In the 1930s, a large dance hall was built, and the big event of the year was the Buck Hunters Ball. And even the deer enjoyed the dance because there were so many cross-eyed hunters the next day. <laughs> this is the uh, Casadero or Therian Hotel located a uh, fourth mile from uh, north of Casadero. It was operated about 1915. It was r actually right across the street from uh, the old Ingram's Hotel. Going one half mile from town, which is now <clears throat> the outdoor Catholic church, was Miller's Retreat. Built in the early 1900s, it consisted of cabins, tents, and the main lodge. It had two of the most popular dining rooms in the area. Here is a picture of the indoor dining room. It was just like downtown San Francisco. And here is the outdoor dining room. Notice the deer up there in the, the left. And uh, I think there's one of those Don Don Spotted Dolls down there too. <laughs> But they tried to make it very outdoorsy, and they did very well. <laughs> Food and entertainment was very expensive at this, this resort. Look at these fees. Dancing, dancing every Saturday night was 25 cents. Wednesday was a cheaper night for 10 cents. They had whist games every Monday. And the meals were outrageous. They were 35 cents. <laughs> Next came Hans Resort, now called Petal Hill. We don't have a picture of this resort, but we do have two pictures of the old swimming hole. The next picture, or, the, or was that the second one? A uh, let's see, across the uh, Han Road from Petal Hill was Broses operated by an old ma maid, Mabel, and her bachelor brother, Ed. There was the main house, a cabin or two, and a few tent platforms. It burnt down some, most of it burnt down a while back, and it's for sale now. Uh, located below, uh, below Rose's was a log cabin. It was a gathering place for locals in the early 1900s. In 1916, the log cabin changed ownership. The big cinema hit Casadero, and silent movies became the rage of the town. The unit was operated by hand crank and was lit by a carbide light. 
Dances and card games were held, and they also had can candy and other sundries. Redwood Hall Camp of Cabins was across the tracks, now Casadera Highway, of course. It was built in the 1920s. There was an open-air dance floor with a balcony overlooking Austin Creek. Booths with tables were around the perimeter. It was strung all around with colored lanterns that made for romantic evenings. And on a moonlit night, it was more than the young heart could bear. <laughs> Elaine Graham ran it in the 40s and the 50s. Then most of the old cabins burned. One or two were left that she lived in. In later years, the hall burned down too. The end of an era. For the story of Elam Grove, we must backtrack to the sale of the town of Ingram to businessman George Montgomery. The property also included what is now Berkeley Camp and the old Elam Grove site. Montgomery leased the Berkeley Camp site to the Bohemian Club for its annual hijinks. Mr. Montgomery was also a rootin' tootin' bohemian. While recovering from a serious illness, he exp uh, experienced a religious conversion and thereafter refused to lease the site to the Bohemian Club, <laughs> even when he <clears throat> they offered him 40000 for the site. Uh, that was a lot of money in those days. Instead, he built the, a new hotel called the Elam Grove and used Casadero as a Christian camp meeting ground. And here's one of the revival meetings. It was across the road from the present Elam. The new Elam was built in 1946. It burned in 1948 and was reconstructed with the help of locals who loved having a good restaurant in town again. There was a barber shop located in Elam Grove between the 50s and 60s, and very few of the locals ever escaped getting a haircut by Curly. And that's Jack Rorick, an old time rancher here. In 1925, Casanoma was known as Kid Creek, or the Kid Creek Resort, and was operated by Mary Sarland. It was bought in the 40s by Henry Kendorf, who used it as a private home. It was then bought by Walter and Agnes Link, who renamed it Casanoma Lodge, a contraction of Casadero and Sonoma County. And Walter did all the major alterations. They opened in June 1948 and ran it until 1976 when they sold it to the present owners, Randy and Gretchen Newman. It is the one remaining resort in the area other than the struggling Elam Grove. The first post office was established as Austin on August 5, 1881. It was reestablished as Ingram's on June 23, 1886, in the Ingram Hotel. It was re-established as Casadero on August 24, uh, April 24, 1889. On November 21, 1911, Fred Roseanne was appointed postmaster, and by that time, the post office had been moved to the general store, which he owned. Incidentally, it's still the present general store. About 1916, it was moved to a building on the site of the present Casadero Inn, which is now a private home. The old building, <clears throat> let's see, Harold Rogers was postmaster there on April 29th, 1915. And about 1918, the post office was moved to the Harry and Sa Sarah Miller building. And that's my maternal grandparents there. Ben Lee was appointed postmaster in 1918, and Oliver Trine, March 
1920. They both served as postmaster in this building. About 1923-25, the post office was moved next door on the ground floor and Ben Lee was appointed postmaster again. The building is still standing. And that's old Ben out there. The last time the post office was moved was in 1948 when Dorothy Barnes was postmaster. She and her husband built the present post office building. Dorothy was also the lo longest running postmaster just shy of 30 years. That's uh, Mr. Schrock, one of the old time stage drivers, Dorothy, and Mrs. Griffin, her clerk. I was postmaster from 1971 till 1982. Karen Naylor is our present postmaster and is still awaiting the new post office I was promised in 1971. <laughs> and it was much too small when I was there. And leave it to Uncle Sam to cut from the bottom. True, Karen? One room schools. One of the first schools was located four miles north of Casadero on the McBain branch and was called Austin. Later, a one room school was on the Millrick property and called Millricks. Three miles south, there was Kid Creek School along the creek and later it was up on Pole Mountain Road. One by one, they were all abandoned in favor of Montgomery School on Fort Ross Road about half mile from town. In 1953, Montgomery School was bulging once again. The locals got together and with the county built a new two-room school. And there are the locals with their cats and, and their do-it-yourself project. There is the new two-room school. And you might recognize it there. Uh, 
best friend, babe. Adolf, babe. Sue, babe. Miss Healy. Our long suffering teacher. <laughs> this was uh, a, one of the Leonard girls. These two. And this was, I think, Gladys McBain. And this is the charmer that married that little baby, Kurt Carter. <laughs> Virgin Redwood Forest, much as it would appear in the Austin Creek Canyon, all up and down around Casadero. This is how the, the Indians, the Spanish, the Mexicans, and also the Russians would have seen it. But when the Americans came, yeah, they were in awe also, but they saw dollar signs on these trees. They saw an opportunity to make some bucks helping the expansion of San Francisco Bay Area after the gold rush and the Civil War. Alex Duncan was one of the first to begin to exploit these redwoods in the lower Austin Creek Canyon. And he was the first one to put a small railroad spur up there, which was pulled by Mrs. Duncan's tea kettle. Here's one of those old giants with 24 guys, 24 people standing in the undercut. That entire undercut was made with an ax. These early, these early loggers were craftsmen. They could lay that ax within an eighth of an inch all day long. Notice the huge pile of chips in front. Also notice the loggers on the scaffolding uh, springboards just to the right there. Many times these loggers, uh, where they had a swell butt, would be 15 or 20 feet in the air, making the same undercut, working off those springboards for days at a time, or time it would take to get one of these on the ground. And here's the same tree on the ground. This, this was uh, just south of Elam Grove, 
This may have been the same tree which was used to build the, the bridge in uh, uh, 1940 when automobiles had taken over from the railroad. Here's Ralph and Wade Sturgeon uh, up on scaffolding, springboards, uh, cutting a big fir, with, and uh, the direction of fall is being helped by the use of two steel wedges. Also, they're using a misery whip. And notice the size of this tree. It's written on the front 12 by 14. Well, that's a giant by any measure. But notice the size of the saw that was supposed to have cut that down. Do you really believe that saw cut that tree down? Focus it a little. This is a this is a nine or ten footer, uh, which was felled to the north of here in the 1950s, about 1955. To the left is Lauren Berry. Next is Bump Jones, a faller. Yours truly in front, and Ernie Hole. This tree, uh, George Parmier, who was here tonight, made a layup uh, once this canyon to the right there, and the tree came down beautifully in one piece. Uh, my grandfather took that picture. And there's a 19, winter of 1991 event at uh, Berkeley Camp, about a mile south of here. This is a, a tree nature felled, as you can see the big root ball there. It's a nine footer. This is how it's done today with the aid of a four foot bar and chainsaw. There's Brady Parmeter, baller for Barry's Mill. Uh, cutting it up. Only about 50% of that tree was usable. Here's the machine used to skid it to where it could be loaded. The machine on the, on the rear, on to the left there, is a, called an arch. No longer used uh, except for where giants are encountered, giant trees. Uh, it was taken out of mothballs and brought over just to do this job. That's George Parmeter in the center. Well, how did they skid these logs in the early days before the equipment we have today? Well, they used oxen. Uh, you can see the similarity with the yokes that's, that's uh, here in, in front on the stage. Uh, I guess there's about an eight, eight ox team. Some of, them were, some of them were steers and some of them were bulls. And I can imagine the bulls would be a lot tougher to handle. Uh, notice that the lower right there is kind of a, a fuzzy uh, image of a barrel. That barrel was probably uh, used to store oil or water to put on the cross logs or corduroys to make the logs slip easier and make it, the job for the, the oxen easier. The oxen were not all of that uh, enduring. They, uh, uh, they only could work real hard for about four hours. So uh, you usually needed about two, uh, two teams of them to get through a long day. Here's an early shot of a local canyon of a, a ten ox team. And look, look at the length that, that the length of that log run is running clear around the corner. Uh, that is quite a skid. Uh, for, the only way that could happen is by because they're going downhill. Notice how steep the hill is, and there isn't a tree on it. Today, it's probably densely forested. Notice the sprouts uh, in the right on the right there. Now those oxen needed to have their feet protected from the constant wear and tear, and this is a, a rack that they used to, uh, to keep them steady. Kept the guy busy uh, shoeing these guys. And this, this is a picture, an early picture showing, a 1908 picture showing uh, the steam donkey beginning to replace the oxen. Um, this is the, about the transition time. The, the oxen were used from about uh, 1860s and uh, were pretty well being phased out by the 1920s. The uh, steam donkey came in about 1880s and 90s in this area. And uh, it could use wood from the surrounding hillsides and it could pull itself around. And it was, had enormous power. Here's another shot of a steam donkey pulling hard. Notice the barrels behind it there to uh, store water to uh, keep the steam coming. Here's a favorite shot of mine. Here's the late Duff Parmeter, who uh, in his early days worked with the steam donkeys and uh, showing him there uh, in, uh, next to one. Uh, that's uh, probably a Duncan's Mill shot or uh, lower Austin Creek Canyon. And here's his nephew. 
pulling one up the hill. This is how it's done today. Uh, this is uh, this is a steel cleated tractor, and the tractor, the steel cleated tractor, or cat, has been the king in these woods since 1940. Another way that logs were gotten to the uh, mills in the early 1900s was uh, spurs, uh, railroad spurs. You can see the tracks in the lower right to the middle. Uh, this is a scene at the Liberty Mill uh, on the other side of Pole Mountain, uh, seen in 1923. Uh, the mill right here was, it was owned by Al Layton uh, Sr. Uh, Junior lived here in Casadero for many, many years and worked there also. Um, but this mill burned down in the 1923 fire, one of the most spectacular in the history of this area, and it was never rebuilt. It was before the age of insurance. Another way that logs were gotten to the mill was, was uh, with oxen pulling wagons. Um, this, this is the way it was done on, on more gentle ground and with roads up to 1920. Here's an early truck, perhaps an Atterbury. Uh, correct me if, if it's not, but um, this, this, many of these early trucks were short of horsepower, so they added four. <laughs> they, had a, they had very puny engines, poor brakes, and would often get stuck in the mud. In the, uh, in the first days of the trucks, the, uh, the, life, the bull punches and the uh, mule skinners probably laughed and thought the truck would never replace them, but by, uh, by 1930s, uh, the livestock or the animals had pretty much disappeared from the woods. Now we jump ahead to World War II. This is a, this is a scene uh, showing a, a way that that logs were loaded in those days. Here's an A-frame <clears throat> with logs bolted together with a pulley just off the picture, which <clears throat> uh, with, through which a cable was, was uh, threaded and went back down to a tractor, which you can't see in the background. The tractor used its winch to roll the log onto the truck. You see there's a log right here, which was uh, used to, to aid uh, getting it up onto the bed of the truck. And this was used throughout the 40s and, and on into the 50s. Here's a couple well-known fellows sitting on the running board of the 1941 Ford on the left is tonight's MC. That's a large Douglas fir log there that they've just loaded and supporting, holding up that state-of-the-art D4 during World War II is Willard Kern Farm Meter. Another way that logs were loaded uh, in the 40s and 50s was uh, use of a Lima crane there, shown on the Navarro Ranch. It's a Hazel Barocha picture. The derrick at the Berry Sawmill was often used to move huge logs, irregular shaped logs, on and off the trucks, on and off the mill, and into the pond. This was used for about 25 years uh, for that purpose. This is how it's done today. All 60,000 pounds in about two minutes uh, are taken off the truck. There's a, almost a one log load. And the guy in the, for, in the foreground there is Jim Larson. Another way that, that you can uh, so-called skin a cat by loading a, a log is get two loaders. One won't do it, and then back the truck underneath it. It's a 1980s scene. Now look, look at how the 1920s lumber trucks were. Uh, I'd say they changed a little, changed a little bit. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, wood rims, and, or wood spokes, and solid tires. Look how skinny those tires are. That's a really early truck. It could have been a, an Atterbury truck. Now last night I said I didn't know the name or, or uh, date of this truck when it was made. Well, guy came up to me and said, I know the answer to that. He said, that's a 1925 Fagile. Well, 
Now I know. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Behind, behind the Fagil, there in downtown Casadero, is grape stakes and pickets coming in to be hauled out on the railroad there. You can see uh, piles of uh, forest products there to the right of the railroad. Here's a very early log truck with one eye showing uh, the driver on top holding a PB. PB was one of the ways which uh, uh, they, they used to roll the logs onto the trucks. They also used screw jacks and ramps. Here's the Beetle Brothers, one of many uh, Harry Lapham pictures that uh, we're looking enjoying tonight the 1930s. Now we, we go ahead to how logs are hauled in the 1940s. This is a Bowen Canellis GI rig hauling some, uh, some big fur logs uh, off Smith Ridge to the north here, or west of here. Uh, that's the Warren Lark Mill uh, near Bowen Dillon Road. There's a big Thies Canellis grin. Four big fur logs behind him but no head protection and no canopy over the top. There's a giant in the 1980s on a uh, Ken Parmeter log truck. Pretty impressive. And here's how it looks today. This is how the logs are hauled today. How about the sawmills? Well, believe it or not, this is Barry Sawmill, 1894. No relation. This, this sawmill was obviously uh, most was a steam sawmill. You notice the real tall stacks to the left to help prevent fire. Um, the, the steam operated everything on there and there was belts going all over the place. Uh, notice the size of the crew that took to run this mill. This mill was right across from the present day Berry Sawmill in Freeze Out Gulch. Here's Barry Sawmill about 1946 with the uh, guy lines to the derrick there. Um, the derrick is located very close to where the railroad turntable was. And there's one of my favorite shots. This is the McBain's Sawmill in the late 1930s. I bet you didn't know the McBain's had a sawmill and a steam sawmill at that. This was located at the site of Black Mountain Camp, which has now been closed. The, this steam engine operated the entire mill uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. And this is a good reason why a lot of the early sawmills burned to the ground. This is a giant human pack grass nest. See some early, red, uh, some early logging shacks at Charlie Filler's mill. Example of a double circular sawmill in the very early days before 1900. And here's a local sawmill, also steam power with a very high stack. I don't know how they kept those stacks from falling over in the wind, but uh, notice it's working right now. This the McEwen Mill was located at the intersection of Neistrath Road and Fort Ross Road, near where Edie Aho once lived. This is about a 1900 picture. This is a Joe Turdy picture which shows a wagon and a six-horse team that has just come from that McEwen mill. Uh, how would you like to go down a primitive version of Fort Ross Road teetering on top of a bunch of one-by? <laughs> Many of the forest products uh, were taken out by lumber scooter out to the dog hole ports. One of these was Timber Cove, which is the uh, one probably nearest to uh, the McEwen mill and other mills of that time. Notice the lower left, there's a dark spot there. Well, that's a, a bundle being uh, lowered down via uh, a high line to the lumber schooner. Incidentally, uh, Peg Canellis tells me that, uh, that tan bark was hauled from her ranch uh, to those lumber schooners, uh, and it was uh, one of the main things they used to pay the ranch off uh, in the early eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. This is a log, the log pond at Barry Sawmill, showing uh, uh, one of the many log ponds of that era. It was used for 25 years or so. But many times the logs would, uh, 
there would be sinker logs and uh, they'd have to periodically drain the pond in order to salvage some of the finest uh, redwood that came into the mill. There's also the burner in the background. Here's the current berry sawmill of uh, Jim Berry, Bruce Berry, and Lauren Berry from left to right. Here's an interesting character of, of the early 1900s who came here about 1890 and he was a good buddy of, of uh, woodsman Scotty McBain. Uh, they knew each other in Scotland and uh, this was Bill Strath. Uh, he was a woodsman all of his life, uh, made hundreds of thousands of uh, split posts and here he's making uh, Douglas fir firewood probably to sell to the railroad. I notice how long it is, so it's probably not for home use. Um, and, he's, and he's holding a misery whip there. Um, and I don't know who the guy is next to him. He was kind of a, he was kind of a, a little bit of a tricky Scotsman because uh, one time he made a bet with two uh, hardy woodsmen that he could outwork the two of them. Well, uh, the, the deal was to unload a, uh, a, a log or a chute with posts. As fast as they could throw him onto the chute, he was supposed to stack them. Well, he knew he was in over his head, but fortunately he had a very capable wife named Flora. And he beckoned to her, and they worked like fury. And uh, by the time the guys got back down the hill, she was gone, and uh, he'd won the bet. <laughs> to the right are railroad ties, which came out of this country by the millions. Um, also bolts uh, there which uh, are what they were breaking the chunks down so they could be made into ties and the log to the left is perhaps 10 or 12 feet in diameter and as fine a redwood log as you've ever seen a picture of. And one of the incidental forest products that people would help that which help people survive the time between the old growth and the young growth harvest um, and also through the depression was tan bark. This is a load of tan bark on an old truck. Once again, I don't know the vintage. Uh, it was sold by the cord and uh, uh, it was used to make tan, tannic acid to tan leather. And there were plants in the Bay Area. Uh, it was hauled by railroad to San Francisco and South San Francisco and by truck to Santa Rosa. And here's a shed a framework whereby they could cover the tan, tan bark. In our Casadero rains, it would become useless uh, because it would be leached and the, the main thing they were after would be lost. So it would be uh, rendered of little value in uh, our, with our Casadero winters unless they covered it. Here's a shingle mill, the Eckert's shingle mill in the area. Uh, one of few. And another, another important local forest product which people uh, survived the, the era between 1920 and 1940 was the charcoal industry. Another Lapham photo. This is, uh, this is a Barotra photo also. And uh, this, this is a huge pile of wood which is being readied for being covered with, with uh, dirt. And then it's, uh, it's made to smolder for days. Um, and here's this picture showing it covered with dirt and they've fired it off and they have to control the the amount of air that gets in so that it won't completely incinerate also you notice the the, the ladder to the to the lower right they had to be very careful when they walked out on this pile because if they fell into that pile uh, they could be severely burned uh, perhaps to death so uh, it was a very dangerous place to when they had to go out and check for uh, how fast it was burning this would burn for 10 days or so before it would be uh, ready to be broken apart and uh, made saleable and bagged up. Here's the bags as they bagged them in a railroad car and they were sold from 10 to 50 cents a piece. Local resident uh, which is on, who is, uh, whose name is on this post behind me, Andy Bay was one of the main Italians in the early 1900s uh, who had charcoal pits and who sold charcoal to, uh, in order to live. Bay Road was named after Andrew Bay, who was a local charcoal expert, woodcutter, gardener, and winemaker. Most of all, he was a very kind, friendly man who was devoted to St. Coleman's Church, which he helped found.
And here's a great shot of a, of a uh, scraper to the right with, uh, with the pair of, the, of uh, white draft horses. Uh, right here is a scraper, an early version of a grader. And that's how they kept their roads up in those days. And to the left uh, is, a, is a, a wagon loaded with uh, split posts. And you notice the initials on the railroad boxcar, NPCRR, that's North Pacific Coast Railroad. And that concludes the early logging. Good evening, folks. Thanks, Bob. Lights. One of the things Casadero is most known for are the plentiful amounts of rainfall. Receiving more rain than any place in the state, Casadero boasts annual totals of well over 100 inches. Here is a view of Austin Creek during a winter storm. By the way, the highest recorded total is about uh, 148 inches. This bridge over East Austin Creek and others like it washed out in a storm on February 3rd, 1937, when Casadero was inundated with 22 and one half inches within a 24 hour period. As you can tell from this photo, taken in the summer, the creek can swell to carry terrific volumes of water. This is the Austin Creek Bridge, three miles from Casadero, a vacation cabin built too close to the banks of Austin Creek is washed downstream by the torrents during the 1955 flood. This similar view of Austin Creek at the Duncan Grade Road Bridge during the 1986 flood. This log jam remained until waters receded enough to allow debris to pass under the bridge beams. The water level at this point is approximately 25 feet. Another photo of a summer home during the 1986 flood. Water level in the Russian River reached a height of 49 feet. This view of Lower Austin Creek more resembles a river rather than a passive country creek. Untimely summer rains raise water levels in summer dams. And as summer dams wash out, each dam downstream begins to wash and the domino effect takes out the remaining dams. 
This was the cold snap of 1932. Temperatures around Casadero dipped down to the six degree mark. Water lines in the town broke and could not be repaired for nearly one month. At a local swimming hole as seen here, locals stood on the frozen stream, children skated from bank to bank, and Butch Schneider is said to have ridden his horse across the creek. Up in the foothills above Casadero, snowfalls reached 16 inches at the Navarro Ranch House. With a view of Big Oak and Little Oak Mountain in the background, this person is quite possibly riding a horse through the drifts. <laughs> a view from the depot platform looking south along the track. Note the telegraph lines strung through the trees. Their destination is the Wells Fargo office in the station agent's room of the depot. Downtown Casadero saw 18 inches of snow in the January 1974. Nine foot drifts were reported in the foothills. This was the biggest snow in the recorded history of Casadero. The great San Francisco earthquake of 1906 shook buildings off their foundations in the surrounding community of Duncan Mills. Casadero, however, remained relatively undisturbed, except for a few chimneys, as Jim pointed out earlier. The opposite end of the thermometer was fire, and Casadero history is full of tragic fire loss to both wild land and structure fires. 1948 saw the formation of the Casadero Volunteer Fire Department. Local townspeople and community leaders organized the, de the department after Elam Grove Restaurant burnt down earlier in the year. Members chose resident retired Oakland fireman Jack Barry as their first chief of the department. This is his badge I wear tonight. Casadero has had seven chiefs since my grandfather. Here, in 1949, members of the newly formed fire department posed with engine 811 for a newspaper article in the Press Democrat. Can be seen here. Jack Ferry, the chief. Steve Matthews, the assistant chief. Jim Bowen, a fireman to be later, a fire chief to be later. And Lauren Ferry, a fireman. An early work day at the firehouse meant maintenance of the engines and the station, along with a drill to prepare themselves for the worst. If you notice on the top of the fire station is the tower that held the siren. The siren blew and notified members of fire. We still have a siren today located on the top of the Guerneville grade, but we're now notified by electronic pagers that are dispatched out of Santa Rosa. This was the town hall built in 1926, where Casadarians met for such events as the Fireman's Ball. With the fire department outgrowing its present location, this site was chosen for the new station. After years of careful planning and fundraising, with the annual fireman's ball at auxiliary barbecues, the town hall was burnt down and construction began on the new fire station in 1969. In 1974, the mortgage was paid off in six months early. In 1964, the community services district was formed as an umbrella organization to manage the park and recreation district, street lighting district, and fire departments. A 75 cent tax base is paid by, paid by property owners to fund the district and to this day remains debt free without a tax increase. 
Many lessons could be learned by our nation's leaders from the Community Services District Board. They've done a great job. <laughs> This is fire station number one in which you are seated tonight. This station also doubles as a community hall. This station houses a rescue squad, a Type 3 wildland engine, a 3,000 gallon water tender, and a newly acquired Type 1 engine. This is fire station number two, located near the entrance to the canyon on Austin Creek Road. Built in 1979 by the firemen themselves, this station houses a rescue squad and a 1,500-gallon pumper tender. The opening of Red Oak Lookout on the summer of 1967 gave firefighters an early jump on responding to fires in the remote areas of Austin Canyon. This lookout was primarily funded by two local sawmill owners whose great concern was to protect the timber and local economy from the devastation of forest fire. With an elevation of 1,400 feet, spotters were able to spot smoke columns as well as keep track of temperature readings, wind velocity, and changes in weather patterns with daily reports radio to CDF headquarters in Santa Rosa. In 1981, the lookout was taken down from Red Oak Mountain and packed, moved by a flatbed truck to its present location on Pole Mountain. From its new vantage point of 2,206 feet, spotters are able to spot smoke from the Pacific Ocean beach to most of western Sonoma County. Still privately funded, Pole Mountain Lookout operates during the summer fire season months from daylight to dusk, visibility permitting. This view is from the steel bridge over the Russian River in Guerneville looking up the Armstrong Woods Road. This is of the Watson Gulch fire on Labor Day weekend in 1961. This arson set fire that blackened nearly 6,000 acres spread from Guerneville over the hills to Casadero where it met up with the Chimney Rock fire also burning at the same time. The Chimney Rock blaze burned 1,800 acres and seven structures before it was controlled. Then Chief John Nielsen, after 36 hours on the fire line, was quoted as saying, it's downright hell out there. <clears throat> this view from Duncan Mills, looking back at the Magic Mountain fire in September of 1965. Arcing power line started this fire with strong winds which fanned flames over 4,000 acres. So strong were the winds that it is said that the fire reached Bridgehaven and Russian Gulch areas within 45 minutes. At 2.30 a.m. on Christmas Eve 1978, a Molotov cocktail was thrown through the windows of the Bottling Work Bar in downtown Casadero. Because of the alcohol in the bar, intense heat from the blaze hampered firemen in their efforts to save the historic building. August 29, 1989, at approximately 4 in the morning, the main building at Barry Sawmill erupted in flame. This arson set fire, destroyed over $1 million in structure and equipment. Fire companies from Casadero and nine surrounding fire districts, plus several units from CDF, and four privately owned water tenders responded to the pre-dawn blaze. The most devastating fire in Casadero history was the Creighton Ridge Fire on August 9, 1978. This fire was started by someone clearing a fire break around his house in the tall dry weeds with a lawnmower in the heat of the day. Flames spread quickly through the thickly forested areas and grasslands. 15 to 20 mile an hour winds fan flames across the fire breaks to create new spot fires. Tree fallers cut burned trees and hand crews made access trails. Air temperature were in the high 90s. Approximately 78 structures 
including barns and outbuildings, were lost. This was the Rometta Ranch House on Fort Ross Road. Here, fire crews attempt to hold the line using a county road as a fire break. This was taken at the entrance to Black Mountain Camp off of Fort Ross Road with the flames advancing on the Tyrell Ranch. Here, CDF Battalion Chief Ed Poe charts the path of the fire spread and plots equipment placement. The fire spread over 6,000 acres in the first four hours. A command post is set up at the Black Mountain Camp where CDF crews received assignments and a central staging area for equipment and apparatus. Here's one of many staging areas showing fire engines and an inmate fire crew bus ready for an assault on the fire. Firefighters came from all over the state to fight the raging conflagration. A lot of credit must be given to the local citizens and property owners of Casadero and Fort Ross Road communities. Manpower was of short supply and everyone did more than their fair share of hard work on the fire lines. Weary firefighters were forced to catch rest when and where they could. Rest sometimes only consisted of a one to two hour nap and then back to the fire line. Dozer crews cut fire breaks in the roughest of country, working under conditions of intense heat and little visibility. This dozer operator and photographer found themselves trapped by an advancing wall of flame as winds shifted the direction of fire spread. Both men found limited shelter by diving under the dozer as the fire burned over their heads. Wildlife and forest creatures also found themselves trapped by the fast-moving wildfire. Domestic livestock, too, ran fences and in a panic ran themselves into danger. At one point, Humane Society personnel transported livestock to Dun Duncan Mills for safety. CDF air tankers dropped the chemical retardant into areas inaccessible to ground crews. Steep country behind Casanoma Lodge and up on Mohart Ridge were contained by airdrops of the sticky orange substance. Helicopters with buckets capable of holding as much as 150 gallons of water dipped into the summer dams along Austin Creek. It is unfortunate that these summer dams, which are a valuable fire suppression resource, will soon be history themselves, following falling to narrow-sided fish and game bureaucracy. Here, grim skeletons of structures dotted within the Navarro and Guadalajara ranches stood in grim testimony of the destructive force of fire. Remains of contents of outbuildings lay in waste. Many property owners lost everything they owned. And what once thick, lush, lush stands of timber now reduced to sticks and ash, approximately 11,000 400 acres burnt. From this tragedy, a heightened awareness and a hard, valuable lessons were learned. This final frame sums it up the best. As you know, Casadera is noted for its hunting. Here is a series of pictures showing some of the early settlers with their game. This is an old timer, Chester Rogers, who has passed away. This is a group of Casadera hunters. The man in the middle is Bill Britton. He owned the local bar in the late 40s. 
Are you looking at the pretty lady or the bear trap? Here is Steve Mackey who killed the last known bear in Casadera in 1949 which was destroying livestock. How did that picture get in here? That's my daughter Carol who was three years old. She is in the audience tonight. Now we'll get into the Casadera then and now. This is the old Casadera road, the only road into Casadera in the early days. If you look to the far right top side, this road was so narrow when it was built they put a railing on it. People would come in the early days with their, their fancy cars, would leave, they'd come to Gurnville, leave the town of Gurnwood, go up the old Casadera road down across East Austin, and the wagon got up on top there, they'd look down in the Casadera and they'd completely freeze. They'd park the car, walk down the Casadera, hire a local fellow then, give him all the way from 50 cents to a dollar, drive the car down to Casadera, they load it on a flat car, and have the train go back to San Francisco, <laughs> they'd take the passenger train and ride it to San Francisco. <laughs> this is a true story. Next. Here's Casadera in the early days. If you notice, the store is next to the railroad. Uh, many buildings on the left. Notice how the, the, uh, the, the lush green timber in, in the background. Also, the road on the right coming down was known as Chapman Avenue. Next. Here's a later picture. That's the Casadera Meat Market. Uh, the store still next to the railroad track. If you notice, there's a box car being unloaded at the station there. Also to the left was the existing post office. Next. Here's an early picture. This is downtown Casadera in those days. If you notice, all the dusters they have on there. This is a, the main meeting place. On the left is the general store, and the right is the station. Next. Here's a picture of an early people coming in from the hills. If you notice, there's a sign, Casadera, a little different sign that we have in the firehouse here. It's one of the early ones. And that's not a horse, that's a mule. Sometimes they call him a jackass. Here's another early picture of Casadero. They really got updated. If you notice, a general store now has an awning on it. Also, the railroad, or the cars in the background. Also notice a hitching post for all the buggies and all the horses. Next. Now, if you notice the difference there, we now have a car in the picture. Things are progressing. Here's a town group together, if you notice, it says Casadera Store, still have the awning. Well, the car and, and the horse event eventually, in time, began competing with each other. This was the first bus in Casadera, purchased by the Tosper family around 1916. It was used to transport their clients from the train in Casadera to the resort located two miles north on King Ridge Road. Here's a building was built in 1918. Uh, the meat market's been moved down, and this was, cost, it was called the Austin Hotel. It was built that they had a celebration on the last week of November. The gentleman is my father down on the bottom with the but butcher outfit on. The lady up on top is my mother. This, pic this picture, the building was built in 1918, they say. This was taken in about May of 1919, and the last history we gave here in Casadera in 1978, I said, that's where I was born up in that window. And someone said, how could you be born in a window? Well, I was born in a room where the window is. <laughs> so I was born there in, in April of 1919. Next. Here's a picture of Casadera. If you notice the difference, the general store is now moved across. The station's still there. The general store was moved as near as we can understand, between 1916 and 1919. Also, on the right is uh, the Snyder Building, which was built in 1922. Also, beyond the uh, general store is, was, is still the Austin Hotel. And next to that was a Casadera Barber Shop and Pool Hall. Next was where the post office was, and just beyond that was the ice cream parlor and box ball alley, which we'll show you in more pictures. If you notice back on the right here, big stacks of wood, 
This wood was loaded in boxcars and shipped to San Francisco. People were still burning wood for fuel in those days. Notice all the cars. We're progressing now. As I told you before, those cars could be bought, I think, for around 400 to $450. Next. Here's Casadera. If you notice, it says Red Crown Gasoline. Box ball alleys, and there's a town in the background, if you know, the, the huge eucalyptus trees, which is only one left in town now, which is in front of Don Berry's Casadera Supply. Here's what's called Box Ball Alley, soft drinks, candies, and ice cream. Uh, in those days, prohibition was in, enacted. This picture was taken in the late 20s. If you went in that left-hand door and went in the back, I got permission from the Bone family to tell this story. You could go in there and get a straight shot of whiskey for 10 cents. This is Mike Bone and his family, who owned the Boxwall Alley. He was one of the pillars in the community and a very kind man. This was his wife, Martha Miller Bohan Snyder. In the community, she was known as Super Grandma. Here's a picture of Stephen Doramaki who ran the general store for many years. Also in the background was the first building uh, when the Berry Mill started in about 1940. Here's a man called Ed Bones, B-O-N-E-S. He ran our local barber shop and pool hall. Very nice man, and if you notice on the bottom, that was his dog called Mutt. Here's a picture of my father in about 1911 or 12 in front of the, the Casadera Meat Market, which at that time was behind where the general store sits now. Also beside him was a Civil War veteran by the name of Ben Marshall. He fought for the North, and after the Civil War, he was Indian guide for many years. He settled in Casadera, and he died in 1927. Everybody wonders about this monument north of Casadera at the crossroads. This monument was dedicated to a man who who died very early in life. A lot of his friends dedicate, dedicated this monument to Judge Trosper. He was a constable and also a judge in the Casadere area for many years. He also was married to Melo, Marowella Adams Trosper, who ran the Trosper Resort two miles north on King Ridge Road. Very large and strong man. He also was sort of a doctor. I mean by that, I mean by that, when people had a toothache, and I had two old-timers tell me, Hazel Barotra and Scotty McBain, they went to his place to have their tooth pulled, and he had a forceps. The anesthetic was a double shot of whiskey. He pulled the tooth, and both of them said it didn't help a damn bit. <laughs> Here's a picture of Casadera, probably about uh, 1940, if you know it's a railroad's gone. Coming back to the meat market, you could get a the best hamburger you could ever get for 10 cents a pound. You could go to the general store and get a loaf of bread for a nickel. As I said, you could go to the local hotel and get a meal for 25, 35 cents. You could go to the barber shop and pool hall, you get a haircut for 10 cents and play all day in the pool for a nickel. Here's a picture coming through uh, what was called the Whistle Tree area down there, the road being built in 1940 coming through town. This picture was taken in 1948. Here's a later picture. Uh, if you notice the store, it says McBain's on there. Now, notice in that picture, we're modern. We now have a white stripe down the road in Casadero. <laughs> Here's what was called Bud Ganasso Sky, uh, Bud Sky Room. Bill Britton sold out in the early 70s, and Bud Ganasso had this then. Next. Here's a picture of the Casadere Inn. The uh, fellow by the name of Mr. Banks bought that. If you notice, he took a wine barrel and made an entrance to it then. Next. Here's Barry Sawmill. Here's the Catholic Church, which, they had a, which had a new facing on it in recent years. Incidentally, I have to go back to the, to the Mike Bone who ran the box ball bowling alley. Everyone wondered where Mike Bone kept his whiskey. Well, it turned out that he kept his 10-gallon keg of whiskey under the Catholic Church. 
Here's the, uh, the Casadera Community Church. Next. Here's the Casadera Inn and also, if you notice, the general store now has, it's enclosed and has a new entrance to it. Next. Here's Casadera. Uh, more recently, if you notice, we're more modern now. We have three lines down the street. <laughs> Here is Casadera, about it is now. In the foreground there is Don Berry's wood yard. And in, in behind the trees here is Don Berry's uh, Casadera supply. But for now, thanks for coming, and God bless you all. Thank you.